Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome everybody, good afternoon, and everybody in their offices as well. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Brian Levine and Mark Corner from University of Massachusetts. Uh, who are spending the day with us today, and they're going to talk about this really cool new system they built called DieselNet, and talks about how can you actually leverage uh, wireless nodes deployed on a bus system moving around, and it generalizes to other scenarios as we learned during the talk. So I think Brian's going to take it from here. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so it's uh, it's great to be be here. I haven't been to Microsoft before, um, and so it's great to talk with people that I've known previously and to meet um, some new faces. Um, so. Today's talk is going to fit under an umbrella we call disruption tolerant networking. Um, and this is a type of network that naturally emerges from a whole host of scenarios. Um, most simply, at sort of one end of the spectrum, you have a mesh network where there are vehicles moving around, and inevitably they're going to move outside of whatever infrastructure you've put in place. Um, and when they do that, you're going to want some kind of failure mode for that kind of challenge to the network. And that may be the easiest challenge that you may face, but if you try to deploy wireless networks. In other scenarios, things get a lot harder. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about wildlife tracking, underwater exploration. We're not involved in any space exploration, but certainly researchers who are studying DTNs have put code on NASA vehicles that are related. Question? In, in your mind, is there a difference between disruption tolerance and delay tolerance? Or there's, there's, there's no difference. I think disruption is a little bit more general, because uh, toler the, the challenge you may face may not be only in delay. There may be other kinds of disruptions that, you, that are involved. So. Um, and in any kind of network that you put up, it's, it's going to be fragile in some way. And that may come from a major natural disaster or a man-made disaster. There may just be attacks or poor planning, uh, different kinds of jamming. There could be administrative firewalls that are set up. Um, and, and that can test any network um, and any level of toler tolerance that you may have. So to give you some examples, um, wireless networks and wireless networks that support vehicles that move around in them. And this is a picture of the bus, uh, inside of a bus that we've equipped with. Uh, this is a Linux box. This is a power inverter. And I'll show you a better view in a minute. Behind it is an access point, some other radios in there. Um, and as I said, these vehicles are inevitably going to move outside of whatever infrastructure you're able to put up. Uh, however, money, however much money you have, I can give you a vehicle that can move outside of that area. Um, and additionally, in, say, a municipal network, a municipal mesh, Failure is going to be really just an unreasonable or untenable scenario. Um, and you could think of DTNs as a failure mode for these types of meshes to really improve the robustness. As another example, uh, this is a picture of a turtle that uh, Mark has wired up or equipped with a solar panel and um, a wireless device. This is all covered with dental adhesive. Mark will mention this later. And in this instance, uh, turtles just don't happen to live near wireless access points. Um, and so what, and additionally, in addition to that, we really need to put on very low resource devices. And they're going to have, say, a short range radio or a low bandwidth radio or both. Uh, in this case, the power management will cause the turtle's uh, equipment to suspend in order to save energy to last a, a bit longer time. And so that's going to be an additional challenge. Yes, with turtles, you can't even harness their movement to generate power. <laughs> we, we, thought, we, thought, we definitely thought about it. We thought Already? about it. Uh, yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of things that you can, you can grab energy from, temperature differentials, movement. Um, this, in this case, we're getting it from solar panel uh, power. So these two black things on the top are, are, are solar, solar panels. Um, but and that, that's enough for it to like stay up persistently? Or? It's, um, it should be. <laughs> um, I mean, we're in the process of, of, of deploying this and building it. Um, the last deployment that we did, they stayed underwater. They're getting really, they got really close to when they hibernate. And at that time, they spent a lot of time underwater. And you get very little sun, sunlight. It's, it's very filtered. Um, but in, we've done simulations and traces and things like that. And it will be enough for this thing to survive um, essentially forever, is the idea. That's very cool. Um, the, the most power hungry thing on this whole package is the GPS receiver, by far. Okay. So. OK. So to give you another example, uh, underwater networks actually share a lot of characteristics common to the, to the vehicular network and the turtle network. And that's because we're going to have a very sparse network. I mean, the ocean is just massive. Um, we're going to have mobile nodes. This is an example of two autonomous underwater vehicles. 
that are used by our collaborators at HUI, which is the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute on Cape Cod. And so the vehicle on the left is actually more like a bus, uh, not in terms of speed, but it goes out for five to 20 hours at a time. Um, the energy used by the networking environment is just negligible compared to the amount of, of uh, you know, up to 100 watts or so for the propulsion. On the other hand, this is uh, something called a glider. It goes much slower. It has, uh, it, it lasts for about a month, and the propulsion actually only takes up about two watts. And so there, the energy concerns uh, for, for the networking part is, is really, it's really something you really have to keep track of. Um, and so we have both of, those, both of those characteristics from the previous example, and actually, we have an opportunity to control the mobility of the nodes to enhance the network. And we've done some research that looks into that, although I'm not going to talk about it today. So. DTNs are really just part of uh, a taxonomy of networking regimes, you might call them, that emerge naturally. And so on this diagram, what I'm trying to show is sort of this toy taxonomy, where on the x-axis is the number of nodes that we have deployed, and then on the y-axis is the area that we're going to cover. And so typically, you have just a nice number of nodes, and we might try to, without increasing the area, increase the number of nodes that we have in the system. And eventually, we'll have just enormously dense coverage. And all of these nodes are underneath this dotted line, which represents the radio range of one single node. And as we spread the nodes out, then we'll actually have a multi-hop network. And what's going to happen is as the area we want to cover gets larger, it just becomes economically prohibitive within some finite budget to really provide unpartitioned coverage and a multi-hop environment. And so if you cross the line, this, this middle dotted line, what this represents is nodes where their, the range of their radios don't overlap, but their movements do. And so that's an opportunity to, provi to provide networking and we call it DTNs. And so here you can cover the same amount of area, but for a lot less money. And of course, you're giving up continuous coverage of, of the area that you're covering, but you're a lot more robust and so on. So, so the way DTNs work, uh, we're going to expect this intermittent connectivity. And as I said, it's going to be a spectrum from where I have a mesh, and I'm just worried about downtime of an hour or a vehicle that moves outside of it, to the, say, a wildlife tracking scenario where there's just really most of the time you spend that, you spend that time alone. Um, and the DTN routing is going to cover, um, is going to follow a, a different kind of paradigm. Instead of store and forward as you'd have in a tethered environment, we're going to do store, carry, and replicate. And the replication is really, uh, in a way, like forward error correction. You're sort of betting against yourself. You'll have two copies or more floating around of a packet in the network, and you're hoping that one of them gets across. And you'll, we'll find that the mobility of the nodes will provide a path across the network and intelligent replication, rather than just epidemic broadcast everywhere, is going to provide the routing. And we'll, we'll see in the, in the protocols that we've, we've proposed, the acknowledgments, a delivery acknowledgment, will actually free up resources uh, in the network. And so once you have this in place, once you get sort of the, the basic routing down, there's many of the usual networking difficulties um, that you'll see in mobile networks. There's neighbor discovery, there's security. You might want to introduce multicast into the system. Energy management is a big problem for any ubiquitous mobile environment, and so on. And so there's lots of issues we could talk about today. But actually, we're just going to focus on a few of them, because we, we don't want to keep you here forever. Um, so I'm going to introduce in more detail the, the test bed that we've put up, which is uh, a network of, of buses that we've equipped, as I said. And we call that DieselNet. And then I'm going to introduce to you very briefly um, our latest routing protocol. I've been working on routing for DTN since 2001, but this is the latest version. Um, and I don't think I'm going to have time, uh, given that I want Mark to speak also for the second half of the talk. But if I happen to have time, I'll, I'll talk to you about some of the security thoughts we've had for DTN routing. And then Mark's going to take over uh, in the second half hour and talk about how do you improve the, the performance of your network? How do you improve its capacity? And we're going to do that with something called a throw box, um, which is this right here. And it's a stationary, battery-powered, solar-recharged, several radio, multi-tier device with storage. Um, that's why it's easier to just call it a throw box. Um, and Mark's going to place most of the emphasis, emphasis of his talk on how he manages uh, the energy or the power in the system. And so this is, I, I love giving this kind of talk because it's all sorts of papers that we're presenting in one forum. And of course, there's lots of people who have actually helped us with this. Um, Mark and I collaborate a lot with uh, Mustafa Mar and Ellen Segura at Georgia Tech. And at UMass, we focus a lot of our time, we collaborate a lot of our time with um, Arun Vikat Marani and Emery Berger. So at the end, there's sort of more specific who's responsible for what. OK. And I think it's already happening, but at any time, you can stop me and, and ask questions. So um, DieselNet is um, 
is a, a series of 40 buses that we've equipped and try to maintain. And inside each bus, above the driver's seat, there's a panel that gives access to the electronic sign that is in the front of the bus. And it used to be there was a paper roll in there. Um, and they replaced the paper roll with just a small electronic sign. And so we have this extra space behind the panel. And so it folds down. And then you can see the side view of the computer we placed in. And this is a top-down view. Uh, each bus has this uh, P3577 single board computer running Linux with a 40 gig hard drive and 256 of RAM. This is the power converter that takes 24 volts in, produces AC out. We actually convert it back to DC to run the devices, which uh, solves some electrical problems, really. We have actually an access point on the bus that services people on the bus and other buses that are looking to connect to this bus. And this bus will look for other buses using a separate radio, an 802.11 USB dongle. And so that's actually how buses talk to each other, uh, sort of crossing like that. And then there's uh, a GPS device that records location and speed and direction. There's also, um, there's also another radio called an extend radio that talks and looks for the throw, box, throw boxes. Um, and finally, we actually recently put GPRS on the buses as well. So it's a very diverse platform, and we're using it really as a test bed um, to get measurements on all of these types of devices as they go out. So uh, we come from Amherst, and um, that's in Massachusetts. And if you've heard of Massachusetts, you've probably maybe only been to Boston. We don't live in Boston. We live way out west. Um, Massachusetts is almost like France in that France has Paris and then the rest of the country. And Massachusetts has Boston and then the rest of the state. Um, so we're over there in that black box. And that's roughly the size of this map, which shows the routes that the bus takes in a 150 square mile area. Of course, it's very sparse within that. And it's actually really a hub. I don't know if you can see this from there, but there's, there's a, a star. This is the center of the star. There's a line out that way. There's a route that goes down here, down here, down here. And there's actually a cross line here. Um, and so we've been operating this. Uh, we started with five buses in May 2004. Uh, we have an army of undergrads that we're constantly training, and you know they graduate, and we get more undergrads. Right now, I think we have 14 undergrads that are working in various parts of the system. Uh, we have a series of maintenance scripts. None of my talk, I'm going to tell you about how we maintain all this, but it's actually how we spend most of our time when we're not running papers about it. Um, and this is the list of equipment, which I've already gone through. So when the buses are out there in the environment, um, they look for open access points that they find that we didn't set up. Um, and so. Again, here's that star map topology. And these are the open access points that buses find. Here's the top. Here's one leg, one leg. Here's one route, and so on. Um, this is actually the next nearest town called Northampton. You can see there's a lot of access inside that sort of suburban, sub micro urban environment. And here's downtown Amherst, where the university lives. Another university is there, and so on. There's a lot more coverage. Um, these are GPS readings that didn't come in quite correctly. So. Oh, so when they find these open access points, the buses will upload uh, information on the latest transfers, records they have of uh, buses that they found in the environment. And that gives us traces of these transfers as well as tr traces of their mobility. Um, they download the latest software updates that we've provided for them. Um, eventually, they would also download any kind of application that we would write for this. The application has been slower. Application development has been slower in coming, but we're working on it. Um, and when buses see each other, they also do a data transfer so we can get actual records of what it looks like to do a transfer while you're in motion. Um, and what's interesting here, I hope you notice that actually where they connect to each other is actually you know, a greater part of where they go than where they found open access. So again, we're actually covering, a, uh, covering this, this range of where they move around in better with these bus to bus transfers than we get just whatever access points are available. And remember I said this was the crossover point, and I'm missing part of the star here. This is actually, uh, G2 knows this is Route 9, and they're actually moving too fast here to contact one another. Yeah? So are you using the wireless setup in each bus only for measurements, or are people actually doing real uh, work on those? Like we're, we're trying like as hard as we can to, get, to allow people to do real work on the buses. It's hard enough to get this as it is. So okay. this is actually represents uh, data transfers that are just random data. Just for measurement purposes? Just for measurement purposes. OK, so this is actually a close-up of downtown Amherst. And you can see that the buses are just moving exactly where there are roads. That's where they have transfer opportunities between each other. That's over a one-month period. Yeah? Characterize the two modes of transfer. Do you have a sense of like uh, you can get better throughput out of which one of them? 
like just relying on well, bus to bus and your setup APs versus? Well, first of all, when buses see each other on the road, they're both moving, so it's in a sense doubled the speed, right? And if you see an access point, only one par one only one party is moving. Also, the access points um, are powered. Um, they're 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 actually placed say in a window and may actually have a, a wide a longer range than the buses and we're you know the buses were inside this panel behind glass behind metal and the range of both of them is shorter and the access point may be set up even for outside range uh, outside access to it and stuff so it's it's a lot of complicating factors. Do you have the option of like uh, putting out the antenna using an external antenna and put it on top of the bus or something? We do have the option of putting uh, the antennas on the top of the bus. We'd have to drill holes in 40 buses. And set this all up, and we just—it hasn't been a priority yet, but we plan to do it. Yeah. Buses go to a <coughs> bus terminal, some central location. And yeah. Day or <laughs> day. Actually, this is the bus. This is our research building. This is where the buses live, just coincidentally. Um, it's very yeah, very convenient. <laughs> um, and so each night they actually return there, and um, they're they're really a wonderful environment for this because at 7 p.m. we sort of know where all the buses are. Actually, there's usually buses on the road till 2 p.m., but 90% of them sit in the garage about after 7 p.m. And so if something really goes wrong, we have to go down there and work at night, and, and, but at least we know where they are. We have plans to put more equipment on the vehicles that the town operates, and that's going to be a, a different challenge because we don't know necessarily that all these vehicles are going to go to the same place each, each night. So that will be even harder. Yeah? I have a follow-up question to what Ratula So the second mode of transfer is between the bus and these open access points you find? Or, uh, uh, this, this is just between the buses as they see each other on the road. Yeah, the other one is open access points that they happen to see set up by students. And I know that because during the summer, these go away. So, so, so in this case, I mean, you're transferring data to or from what other machine? I mean, uh, oh, okay, we have a server in our lab. That it connects so that, that includes a wide area component as well, whereas the bus. Yeah, it's actually going through the internet. And also, it is working with sort of unmodified access points, so you may have to. Yeah, and, and in fact, any modifications we would make, say at the Mac layer, uh, to help bus to bus throughput, we'd have to drop whenever we saw an access point, unless it was backwards compatible some way. Okay. There are supposedly some new, so iterative 11 P, I guess, which is supposedly optimized for vehicle to, either vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to, to base station uh, transfers. I, I don't know. Maybe it'll happen. But when that sort of stuff comes up, then we'll use it. Um, so to give you some idea of some of the statistics we get, um, we actually have a web page that every night updates itself and shows the statistics. These are from last spring. Um, things are actually a little bit different now, and I'm, we're investigating why, because the equipment hasn't changed. Um, but something's different. But um, r roughly, it's the same. So buses are able to transfer between themselves about one megabit as they see each other. And this is, uh, by the way, a logarithmic scale on the x-axis. Um, this shows the duration of transfers between buses. Um, did I say on average? I meant the median is about one meg. The median. Um, for the time they have uh, in range of one another on the road is about 10 seconds. Um, and this is the time between when buses see each other. And again, on a log scale, and there's this bimodal distribution. And we've been investigating this a lot. Um, there's a lot of theories that we have that we're looking into. So first of all, buses see each other within, say, 10 seconds often. And this can be because in downtown Amherst, there's a lot of buses because all the routes cross in downtown Amherst. And so wherever you go, you happen to see another bus. It's also, if two buses are on the same route, they will go in and out of range of one another if they're too close together. You ever, you know, ever be on a bus and another bus on the same route is right ahead of you, and you'll sort of, one will stop, the next will stop, they'll go ahead again. Um, and then when the buses go outside of Amherst, they'll see um, other buses with less frequency as they're on the road and come back in again. So um, we actually are trying to prepare paper for metrics that looks into this in much more detail, but the research is, even though the deadline's soon, uh, the research is much too raw for me to present today. But there's a lot of interesting stuff just even looking at the interconnectivity time. Yeah? So, so the data from like the mini traces from San Francisco is also available. So do you, have you guys looked at it, whether mm -hmm. it's similar to what you see or not? We've compared some of these traces to Haggle, Haggle data, which is much different. It's Bluetooth devices carried in people's pockets, essentially. But we haven't compared it to other um, vehicular networks. We're trying to get the cartel data from the MIT paper. But I wasn't aware of the San Francisco data. 
Yeah, I think it's just GPS data from the movement of buses. You'll have to you'll have to simulate or emulate whatever network characteristics. The data does not contain that. So based on distance, if you were to yeah. speculate. Actually, what we're finding is even though buses, we we have data on the bus positioning between. You know, regardless of what their contact, whether they're connecting or not, and we find that they'll pass each other and not connect for whatever reason. Um, it's difficult to connect, actually, and so, um, yeah, there's a lot here that I'm not showing. But would it, would it fundamentally? So, so I understand like distance is not like a good predictor of yeah. contact time or throughput or something, but but I would assume like. To, to a large degree, it would be like a, a very, very rough correlation. Certainly, you have to be in range in order to Right, 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 right. So so I'm just wondering whether, you know, if you were to just draw this graph based on distance or something, would it be, you know, completely different? Would it look similar or? I think there's two graphs you want to draw. I think you want to draw the, the, the amount of data transferred given the distances. And that's hard to do because we only take the location every 10 seconds. And these happen every, for about 10 seconds on, on you know, 50% of the time. So we'd have to, I mean, we could modify things to do this. Um, we would have to record the, we can record the data of how they're moving during the whole time. Um, and then, as I said, there's a separate phenomenon going on of just whether they connect or not. And I don't know what, what, is, what, what that's conditional on. Is it their distance? Is it, um, I, don't, I don't know. It's, there's a lot there. I know that we, we actually have a separate intercontact time I wanted to show, but I didn't have it in a good format, of buses on the same route. And so those are buses like your shuttle that will pass each other. And there's this periodicity. And so you'll see, there's a, a lot, most of the time they'll see each other with a certain period, and it's sort of nice Gaussian noise in there. And then there's like a smaller little Gaussian, and another Gaussian, and Gaussian. And it's sort of like they see each other with this frequency, and then a multiple of it, because they missed each other here. And then another multiple, and so on. So, OK. So our, our goal for all of this is to move from just this bus network to something much more diverse. Um, and we're working with our town to deploy a mesh network that they will administrate, which is great. I mean, we're paying for it, but there's a lot of staff time that goes into that, that they will operate the whole thing. Um, and so our goal is to have a lot of diversity in this network and, and use it as a test bed. So we'll have our buses will be scheduled movement, but we like to put some of our devices on cars, as I said, that the town maintains to have unscheduled movement. We have these mobile nodes on the buses, but we also have the throw boxes that Mark will talk about in the second half of the talk. We get power from the grid. These are the mesh access points. We get diesel fuel from the buses and solar. Um, we have a series of radios, 8211, an extend radio, GPRS, um, and, uh, okay. and then storage. The buses have uh, 40 gigabytes, but the, some of the devices we're going to deploy, uh, say, on the throw boxes, go down to 512. How much do the turtles have? Um, half a meg. Half a meg. OK, so maybe what? this is the turtles, actually. So what we want is uh, half a meg. Oh, half a meg. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> Much different. Uh, so what we want is a nice spectrum of once you're in downtown Amherst, you're connected to the mesh. There'll be a series of interesting uh, scenarios to study there. You'll move outside of the mesh. You'll see moderate connectivity from open access points or other buses on the road. And once you're really far out into the woods, you might just see connectivity just based on these throw boxes or maybe other peers that are there. OK. So. Unless there's any questions, then I'm going to move on to the second part of the talk um, and talk about some of the routing that we've come up with. So um, existing work on routing in this type of environment is inter inter uh, uh, intermittent connectivity. And I should say, um, when we do routing, we really are at one extreme of the DTN, that nodes are generally mostly alone, sometimes see other nodes. I'm not talking about routing in the mesh environment, which is a different problem altogether. Um, our idea is that if we can solve it for this extreme environment, we can certainly modify this to work inside of a mesh uh, or a hybrid environment, is what I really mean. Um, and existing work, including mine, really has what you might call an incidental effect on routing. Uh, generally, just to stereotype all of these, uh, these previous methods, they'll look at history and say, well, I often see Mark. And so if you want to give me a packet uh, for Victor or for Mark, probably you should give me the packets for, for Mark because I see him more often than I see Victor. And so you use this history to sort of learn what's a good path to the destination. There's a lot of other methods like network coding, like FEC type methods, um, and even acknowledgments that we've proposed to deliver, uh, of delivered packets to clear resources. They're not really intentionally trying to optimize a given metric that an administrator might give you. So we may want to actually minimize the average delivery, delivery delay or minimize the number of packets that miss a delivery deadline. Or I may want to minimize the average energy spent to deliver packets in the system, which will become vital as we move towards these throwbox designs. Yeah. So, so in, 
you put like all the ge geography based routing? Um, I mean, like history is one example. Okay, you you know your packets are headed west. Right. You somebody on the west. Okay, I'll just send it there or something. Right. I think. Um, let me answer that in the next slide. And, and I th the answer is they're not looking at the resources available in the network. They're just, and it's a good thing. They're collecting information about the network. In fact, I would say uh, anecdotally, the as I keep developing routing algorithms, I keep spending more and more of the opportunity, of the transfer opportunity to pass information about the network itself. Like when I first started DT, doing DTN routing, I thought I have to spend all this time just passing as much data as I can. And I realized that as much information as you have about the network, including we're actually at the point where we try to pass information about how many replicas of each packet are currently in the network, pass it. Because the whole problem with the DTN is you don't know the current situation. So the more you can spread, the better off you do. So with existing work, and again, I'm just you know, blindly generalizing. Um, You'll have, let's say we have two nodes or four nodes in a network, A, B, C, and a node N. And what I've shown on the edges here is it's the frequency at which the nodes meet each other. So A will see B every five minutes, N will see B every 10 minutes, and then B is the only one who sees C, and that's every five minutes. And so in A's buffer, we have two packets, one and two, and I've colored them red just because they're in A's buffer. And the first one is going to B, and so we'd expect that it would arrive in five minutes, and a second one is going to C, and we'd expect it would arrive in 10 minutes. And so um, in N's buffer, we have a third packet, and that's also going to be, and we expect that will arrive in 10 minutes. And so the average delay for these three packets is about 8.3 minutes. Now, if N happens to meet up with A, it says, hey, what package should I give you? And it says, well, why don't I give you my packet? For, well, it only has one packet. But it says, if I give you my packet for B, its expected delay will go down from 10 to 5. And now the average delay in the system is down to 6.7 minutes. That's great. And, and, and that works out pretty well. And so that, again, that's just based on where you think they are or how often you think they meet. But the truth is you really have to consider the resources, the, the, the constrained resources in the system, which is not the buffer, but is in fact the amount of data you can transfer at each opportunity. So let's assume just for, for this example that each, at each opportunity the nodes can only pass one data packet. So in fact what happens if A will accept this packet, when it first sees B it will deliver its packet to B, when it next sees B, it will deliver its other packet to B that it got from N. And then 15, you know, after 15 minutes, it can deliver the third packet. So in fact, the average delay is, is 10 minutes. And so it was wrong to give this packet to A because you've actually not improved things as much as you might. So our approach, we call it RAPID, uh, Resource Allocation Protocol for Intentional DTN Routing, which is missing, you know, we're ignoring an R there. Yeah. Why did you make that assumption in the previous slide? Why did I make what assumption? That you can only pass one packet. To show that when resources are constrained on the link, the delays are different than you might think. The delay should not just be how often A, C, B. A sees this node B, because when it sees B, it can't actually pass every packet in its buffer. You might have a network that's set up that way. You might have a network where I just have gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes, but what we've seen is that's just not the case, at least for vehicular networks. I mean, definitely these are uh, routing algorithms that are based on our operational experience with DieselNet. So uh, there's actually not much math on the slide, although it looks like it. Um, the way RAPID works is we take some metric from the administrator, and just to give you an example, I'm going to try and reduce delivery delay explicitly. And we, we approach it as a utility problem. Um, and for each packet, we give it a value. So the value might be the delivery delay. If, if the delivery de delay goes up, the value of the packet goes down. And we replicate a packet if the benefits outweigh the cost. What's the benefit? Well, the benefit of replicating a particular packet is its change in value. The reduction in delay would increase its value. But then if I increase the delay to other packets, that's the cost. So I just, if re reduction in this delay uh, outweighs the increased delay to other packets in the remote nodes buffer, then I, will, then I will pass it. And so you can change the utility to whatever you want. It doesn't obviously, obviously doesn't have to be a delay. Um, for instance, if you would like to minimize the number of packets that miss a deadline, then this is how we would define value. We say that if the packet, what this says is that if the packet misses its deadline, its value is zero. But if it's going to arrive before the deadline, then the value is how much you beat that deadline by. So if I'm going to replicate a packet and it causes a bunch of other packets to miss their deadline, then I've reduced value by, by a certain amount. OK. One last thing I'll note, no one's going to ask this question perhaps yet. But you'll notice I'm actually estimating the delay. And we actually, that's very, very hard to estimate delay. And we actually do it with consideration of how many replicas are in the packet. Um, and I can show you a tech, 
our technical report of this whole paper that shows how we did that. It's actually a large part of the paper. Okay, so um, to give you some evaluations, what we did is we used the diesel net network. We took traces of how much data could be transferred, where the nodes went, um, and we would run a trace-driven simulation. And what this graph shows is the increasing load on the network on the x-axis. On the y-axis is um, the average delay of packets, which is the metric we're after. And the green line shows our protocol called Rapid. And it's doing quite better than our previous protocol, which is an Infocom 2006 called MaxProp. Um, because MaxProp only looks at these median histories and doesn't consider the resources of the transfer themselves. The purple line is random. Um, and the light blue line is another protocol it's called spraying weight. We also compare it against profit. We do much better than that as well. And um, when we do this, you might say, well, are you, you know, are you delivering more packets with a lower average delay because you're delivering less packets? Well, in fact, it's not our intention to increase the number of packets delivered. But we do deliver more packets than the other protocols. Here, higher is better. Again, load is on the x-axis. And the number of packets that are delivered is on the y-axis. And we're delivering more packets than the other protocols because we're keeping track of resources. Yeah? The previous slide. Yeah. <clears throat> so the y-axis is in minutes. Yeah. Right. So, you know, for Huge example, delays. Okay. So, is, you know, for uh, say the best you can do there is about 100 minutes, right? Yeah. Right so, what kind of applications do you imagine uh, will actually tolerate this sort of 100-minute delay? Because if I'm sitting on the bus, <clears throat> yeah, it's very likely that my bus ride is not going to be going to be for more than five to ten minutes. Right. Right. So I'm probably better off getting off the bus, connecting to an API. I agree. I agree. So this is uh, from one bus to another bus. It's not from, you know, uh, I'm not using any access points here at all. I think, I think if you consider, for instance, turtles, that if the turtles move something like the buses do, then this is a great way to get GPS data recorded at one turtle to another turtle to another turtle to a sink. And that sink would be visited by scientists once a week to get readings of, of that sensor network. Um, so in our case, we're really using DieselNet as we have actual traces of mo mobility, actual traces of transfers, and we're getting what I believe more realistic than, than on paper, let's say, uh, how this network does. But I think in, you know, in practice, I would be using the access points on the DieselNet nodes um, to help deliver some of this data to cut the transfer time down. Yeah? It seems like uh, in, in, in practice, the optimization problem is kind of slightly more complicated than uh, what you're suggesting here, right? Because energy is an issue also. So yeah. you want data to be available within some length of time, but then you want to also uh, the minimum number of transmissions. That's right. So, so in, in diesel, energy is not an issue, but certainly in the turtle nodes, it would be an issue. Right. And that would yeah. become part of our metric. But is it easy to just sort of fold that into your framework? Of, uh, I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> it can be done. I won't say it's easy. Yeah, GT. So that's sort of carry on Rowan's question. Um, do you guys think about putting in maybe a um, you know a cell phone or a video connection in each bus and use that as the uplink, essentially, rather we than have, using free access points or bus to bus transfer? So obviously, it's more costly. The question is how much benefit does it give us, and does it make it more sort of instantly useful to the people who are riding the bus? So we have we have cell phone. Actually, our university came to us and said. We heard you have computers on the buses. Why don't you tell us where they are all the time, and that, that way people can catch the bus? And I explained to them that well, they're really just finding open access points. And I said, you know, you'd have to buy us data cell modems. And so they said, okay, and they did. So now each bus has a GPRS modem, um, and we use that up channel to to say where the bus is. And it's basically taken up by once every 10 seconds, stating the current GPS location. I mean, almost taken up by that. So what I'm saying is there's just not much bandwidth on these, on these GPRS phones. They also don't cover everywhere the buses go. But, but I mean, maybe the real answer to your question is like, we, we really want to cover a spectrum of DTN scenarios here. We believe, in reality, a lot of DTN research will be a failover mode for some mesh failure. Um, and in that case, you'll get routing in between where you have access to the mesh. Um, and then I think, and also we want it real transfers, real TCP transfers between the buses and real times for how long they're in range. Um, and you could do a whole series of routing protocols, and we're working on it, that actually use this other infrastructure. And it's, it's more of a hybrid mobile scenario with a failover time. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't questioning the value of that, but uh -huh. obviously not. I was just wondering, which one of these scenarios do you think is more useful just based on your experience? You know, buses uploading data to open access points, and then perhaps using bus to bus mechanism as a bridging mm -hmm. uh, mechanism, um, or just have a cell phone e-video connection, what have you, in each bus, and just use that as an upload? Probably in the common case, in aggregate, 
I suspect, and we'd have to check, you probably get more bandwidth out of the GPRS modems than you do out of the open access point. That's a guess. Um, because they are operating almost all the time, and you're in range of an open access very small percentage of the time. But um, I think what Brian maybe is getting at there is that it's not just, in the common case, what kind of bandwidth are you getting out of all these radios. The question is, is what is this diversity of access methods buy you? It buys you a lot of resilience. Right. It seems like there's a more fundamental issue, right? I mean, if you're trying to use this as a model for your total mm -hmm. network, the total network cannot afford to have uh, a right. set of just because of energy yeah. concentrations. So right, and the same thing is true of the underwater network. So, right. I, uh, Dieselnet so is the first one that we built, and we're building more of them yeah. now. But a lot of the things that we learned doing this uh, are applying down the road. I mean, there's more complications, obviously, as we throw new networks at it or new scenarios, but. Um, but there's a lot of value in, in taking some routing protocol like this and trying to come up with something that's very general, like like rapid, and then try to apply that to the turtle to see where the difficulties come up. Um, let me just say one more thing, and I'll take your question. It's also a different economic model to deploy these cell phones than it is to deploy the mesh. The reason our local town government wants to work with us is they have essentially the same $40 a month of charge that each cell phone has on all of these sensors across our town to measure the pressure on the gas uh, and water pipes and so on. And they said to us, we want to deploy a mesh because we want to get rid of these recurring costs. And to say, like, well, I'll just put a satellite phone on there is a different economic model, which you can do. As I said, it's part of a regime where there is a you know, prohibitively expensive unpartitioned multi-hop network or wide area you could switch to. It's just a different way of doing it. Okay. Uh, do you find that people complain that your buses are uploading data through their open access points? Because you know, maybe you just like, bam, I'm going to use up all the bandwidth that there is, like send a burst of data. Uh, we haven't received a complaint yet. Actually, we would have to know who was doing exactly. it. <laughs> well, okay, that's okay. Well, when you, sit, when you sit in Amherst now and you just have your laptop open, your computer will say, would you like to join PVTA 3070? And, and then it goes away and people are like, oh, that's what that is when I tell them. So, yeah. Plus, the buses have really been connected to the access point for a long enough period of time, right? It's just going to look like, okay, well, something happened. Something I don't know what happened. happened. <laughs> My wireless is always flaky anyway, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> questions about what's legal or not. It's just. <laughs> right. It, it is legal. I know that. Yeah. So, the, no, this, this is with sort of buses doing the same trips every day, right? Each bus, well, I'm not sure what your question is, but each bus takes a different route every day. I'm sorry, right. But what I'm saying is <clears throat> the. The, the pat there are patterns, that, uh, the route patterns that you can see. Right. So do you have some sense of what happens if if it's sort of chaotic, like maybe turtles or you know, some, some situation where you have no idea what they do right. each day? So I think the answer to that question is um, definitely this is structured movement, and there's a lot of noise in there, and we're taking advantage of that. And if you really had a network where it was purely random and you couldn't find any repetitive patterns in the movement, then any protocol works just as well as anywhere else. I mean, give your packet to anyone you see, take what you want from them, keep it for yourself, you're just as likely as they are to see the destination, right? And certainly replication would help in that case, but there's no good protocol, there's no better protocol. So it's really DTNs take advantage of any kind of structure you can find in this situation. Yeah. But, but, almost, but almost anything has structure, even the turtles right. have structure. Right. They have, um, I mean, we actually don't have traces of the turtles yet, so I can't say this with total authority, but we know something just about the biology of turtles is that they come back to a stream bed on a regular basis because that's where they sun and, and, and go in the water, et cetera, et cetera, and then they stray a certain certain uh, distance away, and they also have there's a social structure to turtles. And so there are things that you can take advantage of. They are semi-predictable. They're not yeah. going to be as predictable as a bus, for sure. Yeah. And but Mark, Mark's not saying the reason they sun themselves is so that they can eat. They have to warm their bodies to a certain temperature, and the ecologists Tell Mark that I mean they they kind of, they tend to congregate when they're sunning, sunning themselves. So there's some structure right there. Uh, okay. So actually, as I predicted, I I don't I want Mark to speak, so I'm not going to talk about security. But the but the high level um, the high level uh, presentation of this is actually we don't think you should secure DTN routing. We think actually uh, in in scenarios that we've evaluated. Letting people join your network, even if you don't trust them, turns out to be a huge win. Um, and the reason is um, attackers essentially don't have greater resources than anyone else in the network. When you're on the internet, you can flood anybody you want. And there's no admission control. But in DTN, there's 
you, you can't flood everybody all the time. You have only as many resources as anybody else, and so flooding has a limited effect. And we've looked at lots of other attacks, but the, but the short story is, um, in this network, this is the performance of, uh, in terms of the number of packets delivered by, on, per node for 15 nodes in, in a DTN. Now here I've added 15 more nodes, and the number of packets delivered triples. I mean, I've doubled the nodes, but the number of packets trip, uh, delivered triples. Now, actually, as, as I allow um, some, of those, some of those nodes in the network to become malicious, and I actually, they're so, they're so evil, they're so powerful, that I've even given them an oracle of future events, and so they can really plan out very well what to attack. Even when 10 of the 30 are the super powerful attackers, we're actually you know, a, a net gain, an, an even net gain. So almost like peer-to-peer -peer networks, DTNs really benefit from cooperation. And it's so difficult to secure, it's really not worth the effort as our claim. So there's a lot more to this, but I can't really have time to present. I was wondering something on your performance slides as well. The, it seems there's a, I don't know if you guys studied this, like the role of density. Mm -hmm. It seems like those 100 minutes is you know, just not one number for a specific density, yeah. 30 buses, 40 buses. Right. So do, do you have a sense of like, I mean, I'm guessing at some point it gets better and then falls off the cliff or something, like given, given Amherst. The, the load, is, like, load is a big deal. Uh, right, I mean, you're, you're, it, are you increasing, you can, you can increase load and just drive the whole system to hell. Um, no, although rapid wouldn't fall apart out of that. If you increase the number of buses, uh -huh. and let's say constant load per bus, like until what time the system gets better? Mm -hmm. Because you know there are more buses and there are more uh, contact opportunities and stuff. Right. What Look, time does it fall off? Our, our paper in Infocom about MaxProp actually looked at varying the number of nodes, but um, but I, I think this is tells a better story that that basically doubling the number of nodes actually improves performance because you're adding contact opportunities and there's right. more there's more paths. So I think in the end it's a it's a huge win. Um, and actually I'm sort of to give Mark a segue to Mark. I mean, adding a contact opportunity is really the best way to improve performance. And even a stationary node sitting there is a huge win, especially if you put it in the right place. So, OK. So, uh, OK, so that's the end of my part. Actually, you have your own mic, yeah. right? Yeah. OK. So, so thanks, Brian. Um, Okay, so this, that was a, an excellent introduction to what I'm going to talk about, which is can you make improvements um, in the throughput of your DTN, and what does it take really to get a lot of gain? Okay? And if you think about it just intuitively, um, the, the, the most influential factor on DTN performance is the number, the frequency, and the length of these contact opportunities. Everything, all the performance in this network is really driven by the mobility of the nodes and how structured or unstructured the movement is. Um, well, so one way to increase contacts is we could just add more buses right, to the network to create more robustness. Well, again, that's a question of economics. Do you really want to add more mobile nodes? That's a really expensive proposition. Um, but if you can add something that's relatively inexpensive and just stationary, that's much, much cheaper than adding another mobile node to the network. And how much does that help you? Right? How about controlling mobility? Uh, that's a different paper. <laughs> um, <laughs> So not to that extent, I'm guessing even within the bus system, you know, it has to go right. head to hair. And you know, right. if you could just control it just a little bit, not not entirely, I wonder like how much better can you get? Um, just a right. circle, like your shuttle. And if nodes know that that shuttle comes every 10 minutes, there's also an enormous performance benefit there. I know it's not exactly what you're saying, yeah. but if you could just plan even that one shuttle, there's an enormous improvement. Yeah. But I think, I think what I would contend uh, without justification is that in almost all cases, a stationary node is going to be a lot cheaper than a mobile node. Um, because No, but the mobile node comes for free. I'm saying like you have the uh, same If you bus can control what you yeah, already have. Like one bus stops there, one bus stops there. Right. The bus can take one out of three routes to right. get from bus stop to bus stop. Right. And you know, if, you, if you had your say, you know, okay, take the north one today. Yeah. There are other buses going around or something. Right, so that's a good question. And it depends on the scenario whether you can do that or not. Yeah. I don't think that the bus people are going to want us to sort of modify the routes, right? And, and the turtles are certainly uncontrollable. But in something like the underwater network, you do have a, a robotic mobile node, and you can plan its route appropriately to try and increase con connectivity there. Um, well, 
one comment in there that I show yeah. like actually the CR bus system often like it reacts to traffic congestion. So the buses take home, you know, sometimes goes takes different roads altogether. So that's an example where you know mobility can be controlled. I think all you care about in a bus system is that from this stop to this stop, the bus should stop at all those stops, and the exact road does not matter. So. So I, I think generally, usually what we're doing is we're trying to take advantage of some mobility in the network rather than controlling the mobility. Because generally, the mobile nodes themselves have some other purpose already, which is delivering passengers or being a turtle. Or uh, in the underwater case, you're, you're traveling to some sensor to pick up its data, or you have some sort of pre-planned route that you're sampling uh, plankton in some, uh, in some area. So uh, it's a good question, and, and, and that's true. There is a trade-off between controlling mobility of something you already have or plunking down a stationary box. Um, so in this case, I'm going to just talk about plunking down a, a, a stationary box. And if, if you think about it quite simply, if you have a bus that goes around in a route like this, and you have another one that goes around like this, uh, the random chance of the two meeting is somewhat poor. But if you put a box down where they both go, you can greatly increase the contact opportunity between those two nodes. Uh, so what we've been working on is, is building these throw boxes and looking at different issues in them. Um, they're solar powered because we'd like to put them down and ha not have them wired at all. So it's just quite simply you place this somewhere uh, and it powers itself from the sun. Um, so we have studied this primarily in the context of, of, of diesel net. Uh, we think that it also is going to apply quite nicely to these uh, underwater networks because we have, they place buoys out uh, in the network to, to act as essentially as base stations or relays to other nodes. Um, okay, so there are two basic challenges. One is where to place them, uh, which we have a paper on that, and I'm not really going to talk about the placement problem, uh, and also looking at the power management of these nodes. Okay, so if you have a very high power consumption, clearly this will lead to a very short lifetime on, on a battery. Uh, we're always trying to build more efficient nodes. Uh, we'd always like to handle more traffic or last for a longer time, and especially we'd like to enable perpetual operation, so being able to last forever on whatever solar power you can scavenge from the environment. Uh, so you can look at this as a constraint, that there's an average power constraint, which is, well, if you have a fixed size battery and a lifetime, then you can figure out how much power you can use on average. Or if you look at it uh, from a solar sense, if you look at how much average power you get out of the sun, then you can uh, apply this as an average power constraint as well. Um, and then the goal is under that constraint is to maximize the number of packets we're going to transfer uh, through this throw box in the network. So uh, DTNs are extremely sparse, and that's sort of the whole point of the DTN, and especially in the network. Uh, in the bus network, if we just take a naive approach, if we just take a box and we plunk it down and we turn it on and off, and we search for other nodes that way, it ends up using at least 95% of its energy just searching for nodes to contact due to the sparseness of the network. Uh, so we're constantly wasting energy waking up and finding no one, or waking up and finding only a really brief contact with a fast-moving bus or a bus that really just skirts the outside of our wireless coverage range. Um, so we're applying something that we, that we did uh, previously for laptops from uh, Mobisys a few years ago, uh, which is trying to use multiple platforms in one box to do something in particular. So, so we're not just using uh, dual radios, but we're using dual platforms in this case. So we have uh, two, uh, in fact, I, I brought one and I'll show this to you in a sec. So we actually, we have two different radios and two different platforms. So we have a Stargate in here. Uh, so if you're familiar, you're probably familiar with the Stargate. It's a 400 megahertz processor. This is what you find um, in some powerful smartphones or in uh, some PDAs. Um, and then we also are using uh, a Telus B mote, which is an extremely low power, um, very energy efficient platform for turning on and off. Uh, and then we're going to assign the particular task in the throw box to the right platform. So um, the moat is just powerful enough or powerful enough to search for other peers and figure out if those peers are going to come close to us. Uh, and we we'll pair the moat with, really with a longer distance radio than 802.11. So we can hear the bus coming before it actually gets here. Right? Uh, and then the tier one platform, which is the more powerful platform, that's what has the 802.11 radio on it. That's what does the routing. and contacts the buses and, and transfers data between the two of them. Right. So the way that this works is that each one of these mobile nodes, in this case of the buses, is beaconing their position, their speed, and their direction, which they got from GPS, over a long distance radio. This, it's, a, it's called an extend radio. It goes uh, generally somewhere between a kilometer and two kilometers on about the same amount of power as an 802.11 radio. Uh, it 
has a lot less bandwidth. That's where the sacrifice is. So it's about 9.6 kilobits per second. But that's enough to beacon the speed into the direction of the bus. Uh, so we hear, so the throw box is using its, its tier zero system, so this moat, in combination with this long distance radio, to listen and hear that the mobile node is coming towards it. And it looks at the speed and direction of this bus and tries to figure out, OK, is this going to make a contact with, with me? Is this going to come close enough that I can transfer data over the 802.11 radio? If it is, in certain cases, we're going to wake up the Stargate and do transfers with the bus that's coming by. Um, so we're also looking, we also, uh, there's another piece of this is that we, we do decycle the extend radio. We turn it on and turn it off to sample um, for buses that are coming by, and we save some power that way. Um, so we look at, uh, part of this is that we need to do some sort of mobility prediction. And we look at, we divide the space around the throw box up into a bunch of squares, and we look at, okay, if in the past, this, these buses have gone along this sort of route, and it goes from this cell to this cell, and then goes from this cell to this cell. Then we can make some predictions about whether this bus is going to come within the range or not. So again, we're taking, we're taking advantage of some structure in the movement. If buses are moving, or, or mobile nodes are moving across this grid in a completely random fashion, then I can't make any prediction about whether it's just going to come in and go away. Uh, so we are taking advantage of some of the structure. Uh, and then we also want to look at how long is it going to be in, 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 in range of my 802.11 radio. So is it worth it to wake up or not? Is it going to be long enough that I get enough transfer time that the cost of waking up my high power platform is worth it? Okay. Um, and so then we, we can formulate this as somewhat of a scheduling problem. And we look at trying to constrain ourselves to a certain average power. So we can only take some number of the contact opportunities that are presented to us. So we can only contact some number of the buses that come by. Uh, so the most efficient strategy is to wake up for just the largest contact opportunities. Because it costs us something to wake up the Stargate, we can amortize the cost of waking up the Stargate over the largest contact opportunities. Uh, and so maybe I shouldn't go into this too heavily, but uh, the knapsack problem reduces this problem. And you can essentially show that this is NP-hard. So yeah. Why are you trying to predict when the contact is going to happen? OK, we need to predict when it's going to happen because it takes some time to wake up the Stargate platform. So it takes some time for it to wake up and turn on its radio and start uh, right, its routing engine. Imagine that's like of the order of a few seconds at most? A few seconds, that's right. So uh, you're not going to much into the future. I mean, you, you just need a few seconds. Not you need a few seconds, that's right. So, uh, But you do want to make sure that you, you want to make sure that you take total advantage of the range of your 802.11 radio. So you want to catch it as close to it entering the range as possible. So you'd like to be as, as precise about that as possible, because any slack, if, if you're too late in predicting it, then you're losing some bits. If you're too early in predicting it, you're wasting energy. So you'd like to, as close as possible, predict exactly when it's going to, to enter. It's fuzzy, right? Because 802.11 ranges are not perfect circles. Um, but you try to do the best that you can. Yeah, so you your contact seems to last only for 10 seconds, at least from the bus. Right? Yeah. So a few seconds of delay in waking up the target is going to cost a lot if you miss it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Um, so we try and predict them. Also, there's, they're actually placed in places that maximize. So there's a placement algorithm. And one thing is you can place them in places where the buses are moving sort of slowly. Or you place them at intersections where you know that they're going to stop. And the placement algorithm takes all of that into account. So you try and place them where they're going to get the most bits. Uh, or you put them near a bus stop, for instance. Uh, that's another good place to put them. Um, OK. Uh, so instead of trying to solve the knapsack problem, uh, we apply a heuristic. Uh, and you can look at this, if you remember your networking classes, right? you can look at this as a, as a, as a token bucket. Uh, and we put tokens into this bucket at the rate of our average power constraint. And then we take them out whenever we can. So we can handle some bursts in activity while still maintaining our average rate. Uh, so you can look at this and you can say, for each event, am I going to take this one, or am I going to take the next one, or am I going to take both? If you have enough, enough tokens that you think you can take both, then you take the current one. What's the next one? Uh, the next contact opportunity that's going to come along. So the question is, is like, uh, what? I mean, do you guess that, or like, how do you? You have some statistics. If you use some statistics of how often buses come by or how often mobile nodes come by, you can make some guesses about 
okay, how long is it going to be until that one arrives? How much energy am I going to get in that time? How long is that contact going to be? So how much energy is it going to cost me? And maybe uh, is the current, so if the current contact opportunity is really short, I'd probably rather take the next one. Right? It's this classic problem of you're interviewing candidates, right? And every time somebody comes into your office, you have to make a split-second decision about whether you're going to hire them or not. So you, if somebody comes in your office and you say, are they above the mean or not? And if they're above the mean, maybe you should just take them, right? So it's the same kind of problem. Yeah. So uh, doesn't it matter so as to who you're getting this contact opportunity with? Yes. So, but how do you tell that? Uh, at the moment, you can tell who it is. For sure, because as each bus is beaconing its speed and direction, it's also beaconing which bus it is. Now, the exact question that you probably want to know is, it, are all buses created equal? If, if one has a longer contact opportunity, is that necessarily better than a shorter one? Well, in fact, so this goes back to what Brian was talking about, <laughs> is that it, certain packets are more valuable than certain other packets. And we have not taken that into account yet, but we should be able to take this paper and take that paper and mush them together and, and apply these, these uh, value-based routing metrics to figuring out whether to turn on the throw box or not. I mean, in fact, that's what we're doing. And, and yeah. uh, <laughs> soon to come. It's not and, really um, secret, yes. And, uh, and actually, that's what we would broadcast on the extend radios. Here's, here's my list of packets. Uh, right. Here are their values. And then the moat would decide whether to wake up the Stargate or not based on the utility. Right. Right. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, okay, so we have uh, built this, and, and it does work, and we've gone through several incarnations, and so we've used some solar cells and then used some other solar cells. Uh, we've built some, uh, some custom hardware that fits into this. Some of it overlaps with some of the stuff that we built for the turtles, which is good, uh, for doing solar energy charging and managing and uh, the, the batteries inside of it and, and, and doing that. Um, so. Uh, it, does, it does, in fact, work, and it runs all of the same code that we built for the buses. It runs all of this stuff in Java. It can do all of the same routing things that the buses can do in this box. Yeah, I apologize for the photography. It's, it's not that pretty. Uh, but this is the mess that my students build, uh, and they shove all the stuff into a plastic box. Uh, so we have the batteries and the Stargate and the Telos. Um, so in, I, I'll try to... We're, we're, Running up on an hour now, so I'll try to wrap this up. But yeah, the extend radius to send data to exchange data. Yeah, uh, we're we're thinking about that as well. Um, they don't have a lot of bandwidth, right? And so they have. Yes. Right, but there's there's something else that you also have to look at, which is that um, the energy per bit, the joules per bit that you get out of different kinds of radios can be drastically different. The efficiency of transferring data. Um, and you have to take into account the transition cost as well for turning it on and turning it off. But often, something like the extend radio or the moat radio. So if you look at, for instance, if you look at Bluetooth, or you look at, um, you, you look at the CC1000 radio, or you look at uh, the 2420, or any of these kinds of radios, these low power radios, they're less efficient than 802.11 on a joules per bit basis. The same reason that, in fact, a P4 is, in fact, often more efficient on a Oper, you know, doing calculations per second than a low-power processor. Um, so there's, there's a trade-off there. Do you really want to transfer data over the extend radio, or do you want to turn on the 802.11 to do it? Yeah, you, might want, you might get better throughput if you know that the next contact opportunity is going to be a few hours from now. Right. And so, right. <laughs> Which we're riding on the plane home, maybe. OK. Um, <laughs> That's good. We're getting lots of good ideas, I think. Um, so there are lots of. So we wanted to answer a couple of questions. Um, one is, how effective is this in terms of managing energy? So we had to compare it with something. So we compare it with a, simply a single tier system that turns on and off and samples for other contacts, which is really quite poor. Uh, so I call that PSM star. It's not PSM, but it's something akin to PSM, which turns on and turns off. Uh, and this may be a little dangerous, but uh, we also compare it with wake on wireless, but it's not exactly wake on wireless either. It's, so we call it wow star. Uh, so we, we sort of, we, we helped it in some sense. Uh, if, you, if you took, purely you took wake on wireless and you said every time I hear another bus over the extend radio and you woke up the Stargate, it performs obviously quite poorly. Um, so we, we, add the, we add the mobility prediction part to wow star to try and figure out, okay, 
I'll wake up every time I think a bus is going to come in range of my 802.11 radio, and we'll go with that. Um, okay, so does it still help at this reduced power consumption? If I reduce power consumption, am I still routing? All right, so this is where the question's coming. The wake up policy also a function of the energy state of the node. So for example, if my battery is fully charged, and enough sunlight is coming in so that uh, even with everything turned on, I'm not consuming more power than that's, uh, that, that, that is coming in. Might as well keep all my radios on and sort of take advantage of everything, right? Um, uh, because there's actually no reason to stay. I'll, I'll show you in a sec that we do basically with all of the stuff that I said about reducing the power consumption, and we get down very, very far in the power consumption, it gives you as good a performance as being always on which may be hard to swallow for a sec, but, but uh, I'll show you a graph to support that. Um, but we do, if the battery is full, um, then you have a lot of tokens in your bucket. And so it does try to take as many contact opportunities, even short ones, that it can. So it's, a, it's adapting itself to the state of its energy. So if it has lots of solar power, it will take lots of co contact opportunities. If it gets very little, it'll start becoming more conservative. We mentioned, right? So if you have a full battery and you're taking in enough solar power, yes. you can use the other radio to do yeah. That's, that's Yeah, that's a very good point. So that, that, that does sort of uh, complicate things, I think. So we haven't done that. Yeah. What, um, what rate do you transfer the data at? Uh, over the 802.11 radio? Yeah. That, that's as, as good as we can get. So if that's the case, then um, if you get into situations where you've got multiple buses that you're operating with, and you're going, you know, basically right now, probably you're going slow with one and high with the other. You're compromising one that's closer because of the one that's farther away. Um, you're going at different rates. Yeah, we haven't tried to spend a lot of time on what happens when you have two buses in contact with the throw box at the same time. Um, in some sense, that's, that's the uncommon case. That generally in this network, because it is so sparse, you generally only see one bus at a time. Really? Even if coming from the opposite directions? Yeah. I mean, if you point down a throw box, uh, given the range of 8 to 11, having one bus in range, of, uh, two buses in range, I, I, all right, let me back up. I should check. But, 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 I, I, I suspect it's, it's quite rare. What? But you do see there would be a problem, right? I, yeah, I do see that that would be a problem if it happened a lot. But I think it doesn't happen a lot. Let's see. Let me check my data. All right, and then can it really run on the solar power that we get out of a solar panel, of two solar panels that's, that's this big? Turns out I think we need a third one, but uh, approximately right. Um, yeah, another good question. So we did this on a sunny day, right? And, and, uh, and that's, that's a big deal. That is a huge deal, and that's a very hard problem. Uh, and that's something that we are exploring not in, we didn't do very deep, sorts of analysis on the variations of solar power and does this work in Maine as well as it works in Mexico. Um, that's, a, that's a good point. And that is something that we are taking a lot of, of care in terms of the turtles. So for instance, with the turtles, we can't, we can't cheat. Um, there's, there's no way to get around it. Some turtles spend all their time underneath a bush. And some of them sit on the rock all day. Uh, so there's an immense variation in the amount of solar, panel, solar energy they're getting in, in just even in the same place between two different animals there. So there, that, again, that's, that's a, it's a, I think a rich area to mine is, is looking at these solar variations and how you adapt to that sort of thing. Some of it comes down to predicting the weather. We'd like to avoid that, especially on a moat, right? So it's, it's quite, quite impossible. OK, so we did, we did a, a, a combination of trace-based simulation and doing deployments. So we put, we put, this is according to our placement algorithm. Uh, if you remember, this is downtown downtown Amherst, we plunked these boxes down at these particular locations according to an algorithm that we have from another paper. And you say, well, OK, so your algorithm, this is something we struggled with for a little bit. It's the algorithm says, I want it right there. OK, what is there? I don't know what's there. Is this a coffee shop, maybe, or, or something? So uh, we devised this brilliant scheme. To, we took the boxes, we locked them to themselves, we locked them to a bike, and then we took the bike and locked it to anything that we could find. Um, <laughs> and uh, if, you, if you remember Amherst, this is, this is quite dangerous because some of these are quite close to the bars. Uh, but none of these suffered any uh, midnight uh, attacks, which we, we thought was good. Nobody, there are $1,000 worth of equipment stuffed in these things, so we're pretty glad. What, 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 
on right now, just distance, because there was no radio right at that spot. There was. Um, this is based on, uh, well, it's a, it's, uh, it's a whole paper into itself. But if you look at the traces, if you look at traces of bus movement, and you try and optimize where are the best places that I can improve routing in the network, where would I place, where would I place a node? It happens to be, often it happens to be exactly in the middle of town, right, where all the buses go. That's not, not terribly surprising. Like, given any particular location or any, any speculated loca location of a throw box, you really don't know what throughput and stuff would you get. Like, so you're basing that thing on, like, distance from, like, buses yeah. that go by? Yeah, so you're, you're doing, yeah. well, right, so you have to do a little bit of, uh, of estimation and saying, well, I think if, if I plunk this bus, you know, you're not looking at that particular location and saying this particular location has really good radio characteristics. Well, you'd have to measure the radio characteristics at every spot in the network to try and figure out a problem like that. So you have to start with an assumption and just, and I, and I, I can't claim that these are the absolute best spots to place these things because you move five inches to the left and you might get a lot, you know, heck of a lot better throughput, right? So we do it. Well, you don't you don't want your placement to be very sensitive anyway because, like you said, you know there are restrictions. You can't just place a throw box everywhere. So right. it'll be no matter what. Like it would be like an approximation anyway, mm -hmm. even if you did a really good job right. modeling the environment. Right. And so we're going to take this algorithm and, and a lot of these things and try and apply this to the turtles as well. And we're going to do this in in the water. And we say, okay, well, given this map, and we have some notion of previous data on the turtles, and then we can say, well, we should put it next to the stream here, and then we'd know the best places to put, to put base stations to collect data. Okay, so uh, we did that, right. So this is, the, this is sort of the big result here, is, is what are the savings that you get from using all of these things that I talked about. Uh, if you just wake up and you go back to sleep, this is, this is the really naive scheme, right? This is sort of the straw man here, is that uh, because they're waking up and going back to sleep with a single platform all the time, it's, it's no surprise that it uses a lot of power and doesn't, this is for equivalent number of packets that it transferred. So this is on an equal footing. Um, so PSM star doesn't do it very well uh, because most of the time it wakes up and doesn't see anyone. Yeah. The PSM star depend on the frequency of wake-ups, right? Yes, yeah, so we picked the best one. We, best one. We searched, so given the number of packets transferred by, we took a fixed number of packets transferred by the throw box. And then we searched the state space of how often and for how long, so this is a two axis state space, searched both of these axes to find the best case wake up and duration of wake up that would transfer that many packets. It takes a little while, but you can do it <laughs> if you're doing simulations. Um, so if we just do the mobility prediction and we neglect uh, certain other elements of our system, such as doing the scheduling algorithm, um, then it uses considerably less power because now we have a second radio and a second platform, which saves us a lot of power. Uh, but then if we go to all of the things that I talk about, and we use the full throw box, we can get down to 80 milliwatts, um, which is a, is a reasonable amount of power that you can get out of uh, a set of solar cells on average. Okay. Um, uh, the other thing is, is how much does the throw box help you? Uh, this is similar to what some of the graphs that Brian was showing, which is, how many, what's the percentage of packets delivered? This is in a different situation, different traces, so they're not directly comparable. But what's the percentage of packets that you're getting delivered in the network? Um, with no throw box, it's about 40% of the packets get delivered eventually. If you add a throw box that's always on, and this is what I was saying before, if it's always on, you deliver uh, about 35% you know, more packets. Uh, but if we use our throw box algorithm, it only avoids a few contact opportunities that are the really short ones, and it can still deliver about the same number of packets as having a throw box that's always on. Okay, so uh, we did it. We, we, we put one out with a solar cell, uh, and we need to do some more work on this, I think, because it started with, this is the capacity of the battery at the beginning. This is the time. So during the night, it's my poor student placed this thing out at 2 a.m., I don't know what he's thinking, but uh, it, it lost power at night because it's, it's running, the, the, the Telos node is on all the time, and the, the radio is waking up and looking for buses, even though there aren't any. So it loses power during, at night, gains some back during the day, according to the solar power, and then um, 
uh, loses uh, something uh, during the next night. And this is over a 24 hour period. So at the beginning, it, had, it actually lost 50% of its battery capacity over the time of a day. So in other words, this solar cell, this set of solar cells just isn't big enough. But we know that if uh, solar cells are easier to predict how much energy you're going to get out of them based on their areas. And if we just add one more solar cell, we should be able to last um, perpetually based on uh, this model of solar energy. All right. So there are a bunch of questions, unanswered questions, about varying solar energy uh, and whether we can actually do this in perpetuity. All right. OK, so uh, this, so to wrap this up, there's a lot of uh, related work on DTNs, uh, which probably we can talk about this later if you want. Um, we do have a lot of collaborators. This is a list of students that we want to thank for a lot of stuff we're doing. Emery Berger and I are working on a lot of stuff on the turtles. And Throwbox is uh, my student in the Lungeon. Um, and uh, John Burgess is the student that originally built uh, DieselNet. OK, so in summary, we talked about DieselNet, talked about Rapid. Uh, we s glossed over the security stuff, but we can talk about that later if you want. And we also talked about building uh, capacity in DTNs using throw boxes. So thanks. Thanks for sitting through. Uh, it's a, a little longer maybe than your usual talk. But if you invite two people, you have to expect that we'll talk a little longer. Yeah. As we do more and more of these pieces of work, we're starting to go back and look at it and try and say, OK, what's the, what's the global picture of all the things, all these various pieces that we've done in DTNs? And what's the, what's the overarching lessons that you're going to get out of this? Well, part of the problem is, is that Brian and I are just, uh, we just can't, every time we see like a new opportunity for doing something, we move into new applications. Uh, and what we find is that is that depending on the environment and the situation, we're looking at a really broad spectrum of things all at the same time. We're looking at underwater stuff, we're looking at wildlife, we're looking at, at, at these buses, we're looking at meshes. Um, so much of it is, is, is really situational dependent and application driven that some of it applies across all of them. Uh, and some of it only applies to certain situations. Um, so some of it you can, you can plan ahead of time and you plan out the network with, with no deployment experience at all, and then you can just deploy it and maybe it'll work. Uh, and then some of it is you have to go back and look at how the network performed and try and improve it. Uh, and try and add some resources possibly to the network to, to get more performance out of it. Um, so as we deploy more networks, we are learning a lot about the networks that we already deployed. So I don't know if that's a satisfying answer. But uh, so my question was, why, why didn't you go down the path of actually saying, you know, starting with a map, you know, you know what the route shadow that is given to you, right? And then trying to like plot, you know, trying to figure out from there where where the placement should be. Oh, be. right. So, so, so that's a good question, which is is how much information about the situation that you're in do you want to take advantage of? But then you're sort of overfitting your your system to a particular situation. So we do want to keep this somewhat general and say, okay, well, the lessons that we learned from the buses, at least some of them, we should be able to translate into other situations, such as this wildlife stuff, right? So if you look at it and you say, OK, well, I'm going to tailor my entire throw box design around roads, bus speeds, intersections, traffic lights, bus stops, and these kinds of things, well, then what you've done is you've built something that only works for buses. And you throw in an, in an unscheduled vehicular node, and you're up the creek. So um, we try and keep it, we want it to work <laughs> for the situation it's in. But we also want it to be general enough that we can translate some of the lessons to other things. So, 
Yeah. How dependent do you, is the algorithms here based on the concept that connectivity is rare? I mean, say you put a throw box out somewhere next to a turtle and the turtle never moves very far. So right. it's always got communication. Right. Um, you wouldn't obviously want to be talking to the turtle all the time, right? Well, so that's the thing is that we haven't yet adapted the system to energy limited mobile nodes. So the assumption here in this work, and this is the, this is the problem, is that there was a little bit of overfitting here, right? Which is that um, we've made, there's an implicit assumption in this throw box work that, that, that the uh, buses are unencumbered by energy resource, right? That they have unlimited energy, and so what do I care about what they're doing? Um, but if you take this and you, you can't directly apply it to the turtles because you're right, the turtles have, are also energy limited. And so it brings up some more problems that we have to, we're going to have to solve. So I think that's, that's definitely true. Uh, so I have a, a question about, about the routing protocol. I, I don't know, I didn't really get this. So, so if I understand correctly, then utility-based routing means that if I have several packets to choose from, but I cannot, you know, transmit all of them because my, the link capacity is too, too small, uh, then I, I choose the ones according to this utility, whatever that utility is, right? Is this? So, so uh, Brian should answer and, that, but I think that's right. But isn't there a big risk that because this is a highly distributed s setting, right? If I, you know, I you know, meet Victor, meet you, and meet him, and because the, it's always the same kind of packet that has the highest utility, I guess, right? And then I submit it to, uh, you know, I, I spread it around, and, and, and they also spread it around. And after some while, it's always, it, you know, it's always the same kind of packet that is. Yes. So, so the answer is, uh, if you did it that way, I said, well, if I give a packet to you and you each time. I'm, I'm. Oh, the answer is that that when we look at part part of that value was the delay that you expect. So right now I have a delay to get a packet to you, and and if I give it to to Ritual, then then um, he has a delay. Um, that my he has his movement in the system would actually uh, reduce that delay, and that's the value I would get. But what what I didn't show you in the slides was that we keep track of the number of we try to imperfectly keep track of the number of replicas in the system, and it turns out that the reduction uh, for the first replica is it's, it's one over the kth replica. So if I make one replica, I cut the delivery time in half. But if I have three replicas, I only cut it down to a third. And so there's diminishing returns for replicas. That's maybe the short answer to your question. And uh, like I said, there's a paper on the web right now. You can get from that website that will show you the details okay. of all this. Yeah. But it, it's very there complicated. Some, there must be some additional thing. Yeah, yeah, there's some additional thing. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, it's a really hard problem to solve. Like, we're able to solve it. What we do is we solve it for um, nodes see each other with an exponential until enter contact time. And then for the real network, we just say, well, we actually don't even know what's going to happen. Why don't we just apply as if it was exponential and it works okay? So it's really hard. Uh, is this of theoretical nature? Like, can can you prove something about these? Uh, uh, it's it's, it's really uh, probability models. Okay. I wouldn't call it proof, but we do some probable. We do some some statistical analysis. Okay. Yeah. So just uh, I guess uh, I want to follow up on something that I need you to say. Why you said earlier you said that we are trying very hard to. Uh, you asked the question, which is like uh, making it utility use, useful for the guys who are down in the bus so they can actually contact. You were just doing data, but not actually connecting to them, right? I mean, it's not it's not an active network that you've built in some sense that people are not using it for a day-to-day -day thing on a bus. Is that right? Um, we're trying to get to the point so, where. So what is the there. issue there? So what, what is the issue that we're trying to get to? What's <laughs> There's not enough people. I mean, it's it's really we spend a lot of time building infrastructure to maintain things, and then we have. Three undergrads right now that are building applications, and and you know I bet two of them. What are you envisioning that needs to get done? And things like software. That's it. But, but, yeah, also well, have DTN applications. Applications. but the kinds yeah. of delays you also need like either newer applications or changes to soft software right. in the lab right. or something. It's I'm not just wondering like about in, inside the city though. In the city, I'm assuming you've got enough coverage there to be able to do things reasonably fast. But once the mesh is up, which should start being deployed next week, because we're we're because we're buying Cisco equipment and giving it to the town, and the town is installing, so it's getting better. Parts no. of it are up, and more more and more because of it in tech stuck in some. There are access points that are up. Yeah. None of the access points that are up are mesh access points. That's that's the answer. We have a lot of access points sitting in boxes right now, yeah. waiting to be installed. But I, maybe I didn't answer the question because some people were. 
Well, no, no, I, I think it, it seems like the real answer there is that there aren't applications, there isn't a network stack out there that can take advantage of the type of DTM connectivity that you have. Oh, we're definitely and not here. Yeah. I mean, a person sitting on the bus is going to do just as well directly connecting to the access point themselves so they drive by as connecting to the access point on the bus that connects to that. Access yeah. Right. But, but there are some, so, so this is sort of what we were talking about this morning, which is um, if you look at the density of the network, and this thing is, is are you trying to, tr are you trying to get around short disruptions in connectivity? And then I think it makes a lot of sense to do a lot of stuff at the network stack layer and try and pull some tricks on the user, and trying to fake them out and say, okay, well, you, you, you still have a network even though you don't. Um, and then we look at something like when these buses go out of downtown and they have really no connectivity whatsoever, then you can't do that anymore. You have to start over and, well, not even start over, but there's only a certain set of applications that you can support. Web caching, right? You get on the bus, you open up your laptop, and you get the news from 100 minutes ago. And to most people, that, that's better than riding the bus with no news. Um, you're not going to get voice over IP, right? You're going you're to get different applications that are only suited to this sort of thing. And as it turns out, I think that there are a lot of things that you can do, such as the town has a huge amount of database information that they have that they run the town on, GIS database information, stuff about the town, town records, and things like that, that it's fine if they replicate that into a police vehicle, it goes out of town, it's replicated, it gets some updates as it goes, and that's fine. Um, so there is a certain class of applications that, that I think work really well. Not, not Outlook, right? Um, uh, not voice over RP. Outlook is Outlook's <laughs> actually very good at application yeah, layer really mobility. Good, I, say, so, yeah. I mean, offline cache, basically anything that's designed for application layer mobility will work well in a DTN. And, and but, but, right, but then again, but what do you need me for then? Right, what do you need the access point in the storage that's on the bus? Right, are you going to have your, your Outlook isn't going to talk to the server on the bus? Well, no, no, because potentially that you can actually do matches where, you know, the email thing is a little bit weird because there is it's built around a server infrastructure. And there's a security issue in there as well. But I, even yeah. actually the security stuff is probably solvable hand wavy, right? But but the idea that DTN still you could imagine building an email system. Yes. Email has got to be able to do application layer mobility, right? Just because you are in fact doing message shipping, right? right. If, if you can't map that into a DTN, nothing. Yeah. Does. With it, with enough programmers, you're right. We could fix that problem, and we could put. You know, sort of a secondary Outlook, you know, exchange so server on the bus. And, it seems like yeah. this question that's not being addressed. And really, I don't know of any people in the research community trying to address it, which is sort of the what is the class of applications that fit well in this mobile, you know, application layer mobility paradigm, and what are the right sort of interfaces between the network and the yeah. application? Yeah. Layer. I agree. It's really, really difficult. And, and people who, uh, we know people on DTNs who are solving different different aspects of this, and, and so interesting things I've heard, by the way, are um, it really depends on what the user's expectations are. Like certainly email, we all expect that if I send you an email, you just might not happen to be at your desk, and I'm willing to tolerate a delay in response. Um, but you'd be surprised. Like actually, I was telling telling you this morning, um, instant messaging is actually something that is delay tolerant in the sense of. Um, if, I, if there's a three-way conversation and then I'm out of connectivity and I come back in, I actually want to see the logs of what Mark and the third person were talking about. So it's not, you know, some applications are more suitable than you might think. Right? But definitely there are a lot that, that are not. I mean, a voice over IP, forget. You know. voice, voicemail over IP. Voicemail over IP, that works. <laughs> My, uh, I think the problem is mostly has to do with, like, um, the lack of... Uh, Lack of urban applications, like in rural and developing world, for instance, like where you know all you need is like a high throughput channel and delay is kind of less important. There, there's been a lot of applications and people working on different kinds oh, of ETN models. Yeah. Model. So, yeah. so in the urban setting, it's like you know I'm always like 20 minutes away from a high speed connection, mm -hmm. and uh, then it's a different challenge altogether. Kondo, what you building even? There, we talked about the fact that one of the security is actually pretty central to the whole thing, and that well, having security. a machine on on the bus makes a hell of a difference in our view of the building. So you can't actually do this thing, which is connect to access point every time you see it, because the overhead you the hit you take with security association is so much more than if you if you just have something that is not secure. The bus bus is computer. Yeah, I guess that's so, always seemed like. I don't know. We can talk about that, but <laughs> okay. I, I just I had most sort of topple question. I mean, so, so the real the, the, you know the hundred thousand dollar question is: so DTNs will they ever be usable? 
and, and to some extent, that seems like it's really asking the question, how close are we being able to model DTMs well enough that you can say, yeah, given some application model and some radio model, this is the bandwidth that you're going to be able to get, you know, under some traffic assumption or something like that across this DTM. Is that even going to happen, though? Because well, it seems no, like I, every DTM is sure. different. Well, well, and and, 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 and ad hoc network, in mesh ad hoc networking, we're starting to close in on that. I mean, and, and people will say, oh, no, you're off by a factor of 10, you're off by a factor of 20, but you're not off by a factor of 1,000. Right? DTNs, it seems like we're not even within the range of a thousand yet. I mean, how? I can, I, if you set up a, I mean, you're setting up a bus based network. I mean, I, I can guess you're probably, if, if your antennas are kind of where ours are and their buses are moving about the same speed, I bet we're not going to see very different models of, of how much data can be transferred. Actually, like I was saying before, there's this cartel paper from, from MIT, and we started looking at their data, and they were getting like an order of magnitude more data than we were. and. Um, I, my grad student told me, so I'm not sure if this is correct because I haven't, I haven't looked into this carefully, but she was saying um, they actually weren't doing transfers. They were just looking at how long they were arranged for and they made estimations of like the bandwidth. And, and so, oh, so that was Boston. Oh, really? and it was Boston. Yeah, and that's the other it's thing. It's a different is model. That, is that yeah. we, uh, you know, you get a, we were talking about this at lunch, you do get a different perspective on things. Yeah. I mean, I'm not calling Amherst the developing world here, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a smaller environment. It is. I mean, we have a smaller downtown. <laughs> Sorry, Victor. <laughs> it's, <laughs> but it's a, it is a different kind of environment that you're going to see in Boston, or you're going to see on 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 the Microsoft campus, right? You're going to have a better density of. of you're good, I mean, th these these maps that we show where you show the access points in red. I've seen access point maps of New York City, right? It's a big red splotch. There is no map, right? So there's different there's there's different kinds of. You know, it's gonna it's gonna work differently in different places, and it has more utility where the node density is lower. I was asking a different question. I was asking yeah. about sort of how good are our models of that. So, given sort of that as an input, how good are we at predicting what the bandwidth is? Yeah. It's, it's, okay. It's very situational dependent application. Okay. So it seems like and actually we have like for instance for the turtles, we have no idea what, we don't know, know. what kind of routing they're gonna have between them. Maybe nothing. <laughs> Yeah. I'm a little bit surprised at your, I don't know, pessimism. Like, how old do you think this theme of research is? And, like, compared to, like, you know, a decade ago or more, like, ad hoc routing started. Um, I think it's, like, too soon to be saying such things. Oh, no, no, no. no, 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 no I think it's, it's a great question, question to try to answer, though. What it's, a nice, it's a wonderful I'm goal. I'm saying that the $100,000 I mean, question is, I mean, just like with ad hoc mesh ad hoc. No, no it's one thing to say that, you know, okay, how many years would it take us? It's another thing to say, will it ever be useful? <laughs> oh, <laughs> this isn't even passe technology. I, I think it is. <laughs> no, actually, no, I, I think it is actually reasonable to ask the question for classes of application, will DTNs useful or not. I mean, sure. you, you, can, you can go I go to science fiction, Neil Stevenson, he has a wonderful world with all built around DTNs doing communication, right? <laughs> you believe you don't think that so I huh? I mean, 10 years, 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh -huh. when the major communication wasn't this nice, fast uh, uh, internet, but was instead dial-up UDCP, right. there was a huge I mean, infrastructure of, of Applications built on a, what I would call a delay tolerant network. You can think of send mail. My call is up. It's it's it is right? That's right. That's right. And like I say, I mean, email is the classic. Email email is the classic DTN and chaos net. What's that? Net news. Net news again. Yeah. I mean, we're in total non-disagreement here. But I can do all this myself today with the GPRS connection. I can do all this today on my cell phone with the GPRS connection on a bus. This is the point. Where you have cell phone coverage. You know, in Amherst, we don't have cell phone coverage everywhere the buses go. So the right question to ask, perhaps, is that the cost benefits provided by DTN, are they worth it? Yes. Right. That's a good point. Okay, on that note. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks.